Jesus starts out in verse 12. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And then this famous verse in verse 13, he says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. Let's just pause real quick. Understand what Jesus is saying here. This is the same Jesus that scripture tells us in the book of John, chapter 1, verse 1, who is in the beginning, who spoke and life came to be. This same God, this same Messiah who will lay his life down, take on the sins of the world, rise again from the grave. He doesn't just call us servants. He doesn't just call us creation. Jesus says here, I've called you friends. We're friends with the creator, friends with God through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. I've called you friends for all that I have heard from my father. I've made known to you. Watch this now. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you. Let me hear you say command. Command. This is a command. I command you so that you will love one another. I'm going to invite you, if you would, just to bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's prepare our hearts for this next section of worship, which is the teaching and receiving of God's word. And ask if you would just to quiet your hearts, quiet your mind, clear your mind. Prepare your heart to receive what God, through his word, through the Holy Spirit, wants to speak to you. I can promise you this. Now listen now, no one looking around, all our eyes are closed. Listen now. I promise you God wants to speak to you today. And I equally promise you that he will. He will. God's word never returns void. He will speak to you. We have to arrive with the right level of expectation, expecting that God is going to speak to us. So I'm going to ask right now that you would just prepare your heart for that. God, speak to me today. God, teach me through your word. Holy Spirit, convict me of the areas that I need to to change and offer over to you and give up to you. Show me the areas that I need to surrender. God, help me not to be so stubborn. Help me to give those things to you. Father, we gather together today as a church to lift up the name of Jesus Christ, to make much of him. But we gather also to learn and to grow. And sometimes those things are joyful and sometimes those things are painful. But we're thankful because it pushes us along in our sanctification. It stretches us, Lord, in terms of our holiness. May we be holy as you are holy. We declare that you are holy, God. You are completely set apart. There's no one and nothing like you. Your son, Jesus Christ, equally God, walked in our shoes, died, and rose again for our sins to be forgiven, to make a way to know you. He's the only way to you. We claim that. And we believe that when we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that we are filled with God, filled with the Holy Spirit, who illuminates your scripture, which is authoritatively true. We believe it. We trust it. God, may your spirit work and move here today freely. Tear down whatever types of walls we have, be it fear or frustration or anger. Lord, I pray that you would tear those down right now and move freely among us. We give this time to you. We dedicate it to you. In Jesus' name. Jesus name we all said amen hey why don't you turn shake somebody's hand welcome them here to church today if you're joining us online we're definitely glad that you're here thanks for being with us make sure and write down here right in the chat where you're from how we can pray for you we love to connect with you thanks for joining us good morning everybody how are we doing today we're doing well uh, some of us, how many of us, let's just be honest, how many of us woke up this morning and were a little confused about the time? Anybody? It always catches me off guard. Uh, I woke up at five this morning, which was actually four this morning. Then I went back to sleep till seven, which was actually six. I think I don't even really know. 
but I woke up to the sound of my wife saying, hey, are you going to get up today? And that's kind of what happened. So, um, but we're, we're here. We're here. Can we just celebrate that we're here? That's a good thing. You made it here. All right. <laughs> You're like, enough. All right. Uh, hey, we have a lot of work to do, uh, a lot of work to do today in John chapter 15. Last week was a pretty strong teaching. And just to review and put this uh, teaching into context, we're just coming off the back of Jesus speaking with his friends uh, about the fact that he is the vine, the true vine, the only connection to God. And in his para- parable, if you could, his metaphor rather, he is the vine, we are the branches, and God the Father is the vine dresser, which is a fancy way to say he's the, he's the gardener, right? And so he's talking about this fact that you cannot experience true life, you cannot bear fruit unless you are connected to the vine. The vine is what gives us the ability not just to know God, but to actually know life and to have joy. He goes on to talk about the fact that there are branches in the tree that don't belong in the tree. They're dead. He says, and if a tree branch is not bearing fruit, then it's worthless. He says, it's dead, and I'm going to take it out. I'm going to break it off. I'm going to throw it into a wood pile, and then I'm going to go set it on fire. So this is a very strong teaching. But then he comes back with this next teaching, which is just a continuation of his conversation. And at first glance, it doesn't seem like a strong topic. But when you give it a second look, we'll really realize that it actually is. It's it's very important. And if you remember last week, one of the last things we spoke about, one of the main thrusts or main points was that we need to know God more. Amen? Amen? We need to know him more personally. We need to know him more biblically. We need to know God more. And so as we study through this today, what I want you to know is this gives us a better understanding of who God is demonstrated through the teaching of Jesus Christ. I'm going to encourage you to get out your notebooks, get out your phones, whatever you have, take some notes today. You're going to need those because this is going to be a conversation that we're going to carry out in our small groups this week. By the way, if you're not involved in a small group... Uh, you need to be involved in a small group. That's where great conversations are going to happen, gospel-centered conversations. Prayerfully, that's where you're going to be stretched. That's where you're going to grow, build some relationships. There's leadership opportunities there, and uh, I think there's also some dating opportunities. So uh, make sure and get plugged into one of those groups. Love to have you you grow. All right, if you're ready, let's say uh, let's let's go. All right, here we go. A lot of work to do. Let's throw up verse 12 if we could. This is going to be paramount and undergirding, uh, if you will, our teaching for today. Jesus says, and read it with me now, this is my commandment. commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is commanding. Understand he's not suggesting. Understand that he is not just saying this. He's saying this with authority, and not just an authority of a rabbi. Not just the authority of a friend, but the authority of God himself commanding us to love one another. This is something we've seen, so we're just kind of echoing this to a degree. Uh, but it's important for us to, to walk through this systematically. The first thing I want you to write down is this. It's a commandment. And as I talked about this, I, I talked about this before, but Jesus brings it up again, so we're going to talk about it again. Loving one another is a commandment. It's a commandment. On the days you feel like it, good. On the days that you don't, too bad. Loving people is a commandment. And I know that we have this kind of, I don't know, uh, frustration around loving people. But the fact of the matter is we're supposed to love people who are not like us. We're supposed to love people who don't believe the same as us. Amen? We are to love people even when and especially when They frustrate us. It is one thing for us to say, amen, I get that, yes, in a church service. It is another thing to get on 71 and drive north and to actually live that out on 71 north. If you haven't noticed, that is one of my greatest frustrations in my entire life is uh, is driving on 71 north. It is definitely a challenge for me. But I think it's important uh, we, we can't assume here that Jesus is giving us something that we can't do. Jesus is giving us a command that we must assume we can do. He's not commanding us to do something we can't do. Rather, he's commanding us to do something we can do, either in our own will, and if not in our own will, then through the power of the Holy Spirit who is at, li- at life inside of us, who is living inside of us. And so love... We have to get away from this, uh, this emotional type feeling of love 
because love is more than a feeling. And I don't think I could say this enough. Love is, is more than a feeling. The feeling of love is a byproduct of the action of love. Once again, we have stated this a million times. But the feeling of love, that's the part of love we all like, right? That's the part of love that's all sugary and sweet and, you know, velvety and kind and warm and fuzzy. We all love that part of love. The part of love that we don't love is the action of love. Well, the action of love is what actually creates the feeling of love. And so the feeling is a byproduct of the action, massive for us to understand. And I would say it like this, in a little bit of a twist, and we're going to move on from that. Love is not an emotion. Understand what I'm saying now. Love is not an emotion. Love is a volition. Turn to your neighbor and say volition. I don't know if that's a word that we normally use in our everyday vocabulary, but volition could be equated with like willpower or determination or a like, I'm not going to stop until I get it. I'm not going to quit until I've completed. I have a willpower to do a thing and I'm going to do it. Love is not an emotion. Love is a volition. Love is not something you have to feel. Listen now, this is important. Love is not something you have to feel, but love is something you have to do. Understand that. It's not something you have to feel, but it is something you have to do. Well, who says I have to do it? Jesus. He commands us. Commands us to love one another. Who are the one another's? We all are the one another's. Everybody in this room, everybody outside of this room, we are commanded to love them. Even on the days we don't feel like it. Even in the moments when we feel like they don't deserve it. Love is a volition. We have to be determined in it. And how many of us know sometimes loving people takes all the willpower that we have? Can I get an amen? Some of you wives just amen a little too loud. I don't know what we should do about that. But it's important for us to understand that love is something that we just need to do. Determination, decision, sheer willpower. This is how we are to love. This is how we're supposed to love our enemies. This is supposed to be how we love the people who hurt us. See, Jesus tells us to love our enemies, and I don't think we truly understand what that means. I know for me, for a long time, I, I really, when I think about loving people that I don't like, you know, what, you ever hear somebody say that? Like, I, 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 I love you. I don't really like you right now. I love you. You know, I was always like, what do you mean by that, right? Loving somebody who is your enemy, loving somebody who has hurt you, doesn't mean that you have to drum up some, I don't know, fake type of emotional dialogue with them. You know, and I think a lot of times in church, we think that we have to like pretend and pretending gets us into a lot of trouble. Would you agree with that? Yeah, because we're denying the truth inside of us. We're putting on a, a false front. Jesus doesn't call us to do that. In fact, I would say real, sincere, honest, biblical community should be taking place. And if real, sincere, biblical community is going to be taking place, there's going to be people inside your church you might not like. Let's just be honest about that. There are going to be some people inside your biblical community, your church community, that you might not see eye to eye with. Good grief, have the last two to three years not proven that there are certain issues that, that we might not all agree on. Amen? And yet, all, oftentimes, we see them completely dividing small groups, dividing churches, dividing relationships and friendships. People saying, well, I don't like them. I'm not around them. I don't believe what they believe. I don't like what they have to say, and they have a position on this. Stop. Love one another. And when you don't feel like it, you're still supposed to walk that out. Now, what does that mean? If it doesn't mean that we just pretend, like just put on a smiley face and, hey, love your brother. That's the worst, by the way, isn't it? And that's the worst. Ah, I love your brother. You turn around, you're like, man, I hate that guy. You know? <laughs> no, here's how we love someone. And this is where loving someone in action is a good thing. Because I can't drum up fake emotions for you. And you can't do that for someone else. But what I can do is take pure uh, um, action steps. I can pray for you. I can pray. Praying for someone that you don't necessarily like is an action step of love. God, I pray that you would be with them. God, I pray that you would bless them. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would give me a heart for them. 
How can I be of service to them? How can I serve them? You know what oftentimes happens when we love people through volition instead of just emotion? When we love people through volition, oftentimes what happens is we actually begin to have our hearts turned towards them, even in emotion. We begin, to, uh, we begin to know more about their lives. We begin to get a burden for them, a heart for them. This is what it means to love someone truly. Don't drum up false feelings. Take actions. Pray. Have a caring attitude. Ask that the Holy Spirit would change your heart. And, 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 and for us as a church, we should be doing this with the people around us, but we should equally be doing this for the people who are not around us. Right now, I don't know how aware you are, but there's a lot going on in our world. And there's a lot of pointing fingers at who's the bad guy and what's happening over here. And you should be mad at this person and you should hate this group of people. And, you know, you should be angry at this country. Okay, regardless, because there's so much misinformation. I don't know what's going on from here to there. Can we all just agree? Sometimes I think this is good. Sometimes I think that is bad. Sometimes I hear this guy's good. And other times I hear this guy's evil. I don't know. Here's what I can tell you. I'm to love them all. We should be praying for our people in leadership. Amen? Oh, I can get a good enough amen for that. We should be praying for the people in leadership over our country. Now, I didn't ask you if you like the guy. I didn't ask you if you like the people. I'm not asked by Jesus. Do you like them? Okay, then pray for them. No, I'm called to love, and love in action means prayer. God, change my heart towards that person. God, give that person wisdom. God, draw that person to you. And in my prayers and in my heart, what takes place is I am demonstrating love. And Jesus commands us to love one another. And I also say why this falls in the zone specifically of what we're walking through in this series Deconstruction is this simple point. Love, now love is demonstrated as we just talked about, okay? Love reconstructs deconstruction. What is the thing that cures a deconstructionist? What is the thing that a deconstructionist needs? I'll tell you, it's somebody who will walk with them in love. Church, I have to hammer on this. Sometimes when a brother or a sister in Christ or somebody who looks like a brother or sister in Christ starts to walk away from Jesus or biblical community or your church or your small group, we immediately become the Pharisees who throw the stones. And not only that, we begin to feel justified in the tossing of stones. Well, they did that or they did this. And maybe something about their life gets exposed And all of a sudden, we feel like we have even more artillery. We have even more to to throw at them and to substantiate our our anger, our frustration with them. And we leave them alone. Do you know that most deconstruction takes place in isolation? Do you know that I promise you there are people right here within the sound of my voice that are walking through a difficult season as it pertains to their faith or their belief in God? Right now, some of you right now are wrestling with whether or not this is even real. But you might be too afraid to say anything to anybody because you would rather walk it out in isolation than feel judgment or or, or retribution for what you're walking through. You know what that speaks to? It speaks to human depravity. No, you know what it speaks to? It speaks to us not being a biblically accurate loving church. That's what it speaks to. Listen, I want you to know whatever you're walking through, whatever thoughts you're having, whatever questions about yourself or your identity, or whatever struggle you're having as it pertains to your thoughts about God or faith, we should be able to share those things with one another. We should be able to talk. Do not walk through this in isolation. There have been many issues throughout generations that people have walked through in isolation in their churches, which has marginalized them and pushed them off alone by themselves, oftentimes deepening the wound, oftentimes making that wound fester when all along, all that individual needed, listen now, was a strong brother, a strong sister in Christ to walk alongside of them. In other words, you just need to love people. You need to love them. 
whether they do you harm, whether you don't believe what they believe, whether they're questioning, no matter what they've said, you're supposed to love them. Don't misunderstand me. You're not called to be a doormat, but you are called to be Jesus. How often, you know, and I would say maybe husbands, if you've been married for any length of time, you might know this. Sometimes your wife doesn't want you to fix the issue. She just wants you to listen to it. You know, I feel like I keep learning this over and over. I haven't learned it yet. I keep hearing it. Um, because oftentimes, you know, your spouse or significant other, they, they literally will, they'll tell you a problem. And us as men, something like comes up inside of us, you know, like, I can fix it. You know what I mean? Why don't you listen to me? I'll tell you exactly what you should do. Here's, and, and, you know, your spouse will be, I don't want you to tell me what to do. I just wanted to tell you. I just wanted to get it out. Oftentimes when people are deconstructing their faith, they don't want you to fix it. They just want to be able to share it. They just want to tell you, man, I'm really struggling in my faith. I'm really struggling. I'm, and, and this is what we do as Christians. We jump in, right, and we put on our cape, and we're like, let me tell you what to do. Are you in a small group? Have you done a Bible study? Have you downloaded the Bible app? Have you, you know, just listen. Just put your arm around them, if it's appropriate. Put your arm around them and just walk with them and just love them. And even when you don't feel like it, walk with them through that process. Now, here's where it gets a little tricky. Look at this in verse uh, 13, John 15, 13. Watch this now. Greater love has no one than this, that someone, Jesus' words now, that someone laid down his life for his friends. This is interesting because oftentimes we have this saying, if someone can walk away from us, then let them walk. Listen, if they can walk away, then let them walk. And in a lot of situations, I might say this is true. But in terms of faith and deconstruction, no. No. If someone can walk away from you, run after them. If someone can walk away from the faith, go be annoyingly in their face, just loving them to death. Chase after them, even if you don't feel like it. You be like, well, I don't feel like doing that. I've gone over. I've taken them food. I've, I've hung out with them. I've, I've I've talked to them. I don't really feel like it. I don't feel I don't feel like doing that for them. Can I give you a point real quick? And hold off from putting up this point till I actually say it. If you could listen to this, I want to give you a, a really strong truth that maybe you haven't considered before. In terms of loving people around you, and honestly, the arrogance that we have inside of ourselves to be loved. Here's a point. Jesus didn't feel like dying for us. Now just take that for a minute. I know that we sing songs about the love of Jesus, and it's true. I know that we sing songs about the sacrificial attitude and nature of Christ, and it's true. But you've got to understand, at the end of the day, Jesus didn't feel like dying for you. He didn't feel like dying for me. If that hits you a little funny, let me just read you a little passage of scripture. The book of Luke says this, Luke chapter 22, and it kind of records what Jesus is walking through. It says this, and Jesus came out and went as he was, as was his custom to the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him. Now watch this now, verse 40. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Verse 41, and he withdrew, Jesus from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed. Watch this now. Watch what he prays to God the Father, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, Father, if there's another way to go about this, can we do that? Do I, is, do I have to die? I don't really look forward to being tortured. I'm not really looking forward to this, this brutal wrath that I'm going to endure. Then he goes on, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In other words, I don't want this to happen. I will have it happen. I will allow it, but I don't really want it to take place. Watch this, verse 43. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him and being in, what's that word? Agony. Agony. He prayed more, what's that word? Earnestly. What's he praying more earnestly? What is the agony? God, if there's another way. God, if there's another way, take this from me. I don't feel like doing this. I don't really want to do this. This is not something I'm looking forward to. Take this away from me. This is, and he's praying this in agony so earnestly that God sends an angel to strengthen him. Look at this. It says, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. I can say this. Regardless of how much I have never wanted to do a thing, I've never wanted to not do a thing as much as Jesus didn't want to walk through what he was about to walk through. 
I've never prayed so hard that my sweat turned into blood. I've never prayed so hard and in great, such ag- great agony that God had to send an angel to strengthen me. Jesus didn't feel like dying. So I'm so thankful that the love that Jesus Christ demonstrated was not an emotional love only, but a love that came out of willpower, a love that came out of a mental fortitude that said, I am going to do what God the Father has called me to do. I am going to obey. I am going to put into action my love, and I'm going to demonstrate my love. Scripture tells us in the book of Romans that God demonstrated his love for us and sending Jesus Christ to die. That is the true act, the true walking out of love. Jesus laid down his life out of love, but this love was not an emotion. This love was a volition. It was a decision. This is so important for us to understand because if Jesus can lay his life down for us, even when he wasn't feeling it, How much more should we lay down our lives and love people when we don't feel like it? Come on, church. If Jesus can lay down his life when he wasn't feeling it, if he can love us when he wasn't feeling it, how much more should we love the people around us when we're not feeling it? Amen? Amen. This is a commandment. And my prayer is that it begins to change our community. The love in which we love one another. That it should change our biblical community. Now, Jesus takes a hard right turn here into something different. And he uses everything he's talked to up to this point to push forward this next point. But it's interesting, and it's very important for us to understand. Look at this in verse 16. John 15, verse 16. Jesus says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask my Father... In his name, he may give it to you. Throw back up verse 15 if you could. Look at this. Jesus says, I did not, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Look at your neighbor and say, okay, here we go. All right. Because this is a portion of scripture that is going to ruffle some feathers. It just is. This is a much deeper topic than we might be even thinking about on a Sunday morning. This is a challenging topic for sure. And the first point I want you to write down under this subheading is this. We were chosen by God. We were chosen by God. Chosen how? Chosen what? What do you mean? We're chosen by God to know God. We were called by God. We were chosen by God. And like I said, this point is one that's likely to ruffle some feathers. This point bothers some people. This point bothers some people uh, because of the understanding that some people, uh, you know, are frustrated by the fact that God has called people to salvation. Not some people. God, anybody who knows God is called by God to know God. Now, let's put it in the context of the relationship with the disciples, because maybe, maybe you would say, like, well, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and, and he's specifically talking to the disciples, but it's pertinent for us as well. And there is a way in which the disciples could have been very confused when Jesus said he called them, like, or he chose them. Because if I'm, if I'm Peter, I'm like, well, Jesus, I was the one chilling in my boat with my nets, and you came along, but I chose to follow you, right? I chose to follow you. Yeah, you're saying that you chose me, but I chose you. I know in my mind I made the decision to follow after you. Look at this in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1 says this. It says this in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse 4. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. This passage, along with many other passages, clearly demonstrates the fact that God called us before we even had an option to choose him. God knew you, God formed you, he created you, he called you, he brought you to life before you even knew him, before you could even call on him. God demonstrated his love for you first. And so as we're talking to disciples, I know there's a little bit of a confusion among them being like, well, we chose you and we, we chose you. But here's the point that Jesus would make. Yeah, you chose me, but I chose you first. I chose you first. 
I called you first. Now, why does Jesus mention this? Well, he mentions it for a number of reasons, but one of which is to demonstrate, further demonstrate, his love in action. Choosing to love someone who hates you, which is what we all are at first, right? We are enemies of God in this world. We are fully depraved. Let's define that word. Depraved means there's nothing good inside of us. There's nothing good in terms of saving inside of me. That exists in all of us from the moment that you are born to the moment that you meet Jesus. There is nothing inside of me that even has the desire to follow after God. I was having this conversation with my oldest son driving to church today. We're talking about this point, right? And he, and he made a good point. He's like, you know, Dad, what can a dead person do, uh, you know, in terms of choosing to be alive again? Like, they, they, they can't, right? And Scripture tells us we are dead. How can a dead person choose to be made alive? They cannot. So do you choose to follow after Jesus? Yes, you do. Just understand, God chose you first. It is the ability that we, it is, it, we have the ability to follow after Jesus because he called us out first. That's it. And I know so often people get upset by this. We get really upset. So I'm going to back off a little bit. Let's just have a little more conversational tone. Sometimes we get upset. We're like, well, I don't like the fact that, that God calls somebody. I don't like the fact that God chooses people. And, and, and more than that, how do I know if I'm chosen by God? I can I can, we can take care of that right now. If you're concerned that maybe God hasn't chosen you or called you to salvation, let's just clear that up right now. Why don't you just surrender your life to Christ right now, in this moment. And if you surrender your life to Jesus in this moment, it will prove and show that God called you before you chose him. Well, I don't like that logic. Why? It's theologically sound. If you continue to reject Jesus Christ, if you continue to walk away from God till the day that you die, it will thereby also show that you literally were not chosen and called by God. Listen, predestination will never preclude you from being saved. It only proves when you cooperate by your choice that you were chosen by him. Understand that. This is massive. This is important. Predestination will never preclude you from being saved. It only proves when you cooperate by your choice that you were chosen by him. God demonstrated his love for us and calling us before we knew him and leaning down and reaching his heart, in, his hand into our heart before we were even worthy of it. And so this knocks all of your excuses Right off the shelf. And let me say how. So many of us don't think that we can come to Jesus because of the things that we've done in our life. Come on. You know that that's true. So many of us, we feel like we're unworthy to know God. We feel like we have to carry guilt and shame around because of something we've done, something we've said, someplace we've been. God called you. God chose you with the understanding of what you would do, who you would be, where you would go, the sin in your life. He saw all that, and he still reached down and said, no, I want her. No, I want him. God's grace, God's love, God's forgiveness is so much greater than any sin in your life. Please hear me. God's love, God's grace, God's mercy is greater than any sin in your life. And I got to lean into this a little bit because how arrogant do we have to be to think that our sin is greater than God's love? That's a level of arrogance that truly demonstrates our depravity. Your sin has never been and will never be greater than the love of God of Jesus Christ. He demonstrated it by coming to this world. He demonstrated it by going to the cross. He demonstrated it by rising again. He's demonstrating it even right now through the teaching of his word. God loves you. Listen to me right now. God loves you and he's called you. And for some of you, it is time for you to surrender your life to a God who is calling you to life right now. In this moment, you have allowed that sin, you have allowed that guilt, you have allowed that shame, you have allowed that relationship, I don't care what it is, to hold you back. Stop. Stop right now. 
Allow God's love to be greater in your life than that sin. And here's what it looks like. It looks like you just saying, God, I surrender it. I give it to you. I give you my sin. I give you my failures. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you're the Messiah. I believe that you are God, and I give you my life. And so I'm going to right now, just right where we sit, right now, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? There doesn't even need to be any type of build up or anything like that. This is not emotional coercion. This is just straight up us surrendering to Jesus. If sin has kept you from Christ, if guilt has kept you from Jesus, right now in this moment, now is your time, now is your day to surrender to the love of Jesus, to know God. Right now where you sit, would you just pray with me? No one looking around, eyes closed, heads bowed. If you want to know this love, if you want to know this Jesus, surrender to him. Listen, no amount of right living is going to save you. No amount of willpower and proper mentality is going to relieve you of guilt and shame. You can't offload that stuff. But Jesus can. Listen, Jesus can. Jesus is my friend. He's my friend. He's there for me when no one else is. He's never lied to me. He's always been true. He's always been faithful. He's, he's demonstrated his love for me. He loves me way more than I love him. I'm trying. He blesses me. He kicks my butt when I need it. He puts me back in line. He speaks life into me. In my darkest moments, he's been with me. In my best moments, he's walked with me. In my failures and my victories, he's been with me. And he's loved me the same through all of it. There's nothing that I could ever do that would make him walk away. And when I die, I promise to live in eternity with him where there's no more death and suffering, wars and COVID and hatred and racism. following after Jesus if having true life and joy is what you would desire I would just say surrender surrender it's not going to be easy it's going to be hard but it's worth it if you want to know this Jesus would you just pray with me take these first steps just it's not a magic prayer it's your heart he'll give you the faith to pray just pray with me Jesus Forgive me of my sin. I believe that you are the one true God. I believe that you died for me, that you rose again to give me life. Save me. Take my sin. Take my guilt and my shame. And save me. Live in my heart. Walk with me. I claim that heaven is my home. Jesus' name. Amen. With your eyes closed, your heads bowed. I'm not going to call you by name, but I'm going to I'm going to count to three. And when I count to three, if you prayed that prayer, you meant that. Look, no one's going to come attack you, I promise. And it's just me looking around. But I think your first move should be one of boldness. I'm going to count to three. When I count to three, if you prayed that prayer and you meant that, I want you to raise your hand. Because I want to pray for you. Okay. One, two, you prayed that prayer and you meant it. Be bold right now in this moment. One, two, three. Right now, you lift your hand. Yeah, man. I see. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Amen. God, thank you. Thanks for working in us. Thank you for working in your church. Thank you for choosing us. Long before we chose you.